Irina, I'm so happy to have you on this podcast today. How are you? I'm doing very well and it's a joy to be with you, Sonia. And this very interesting subject that we decided that we'll discuss today is Indian jewelry. And obviously, we're not going to do the whole history of Indian jewelry in our 20, 22 minutes that this podcast lasts, but we're going to go through the highlights. And I think, you know, let's get started with when does it start, the first expression of Indian jewelry? You know, this is so interesting. It's such a vast topic, as you said, and it's a fascinating one. So Indian jewelry history really goes 5,000 years back. And the early examples come from the Indus Valley civilization. And I feel that Indian jewelry started with so many amazing, great examples that show the technical as well as deeply embedded symbolism of Indian jewelry. There are a couple of examples that I would love to share. The first one comes from the first century BC, the Satvahana dynasty of Andhra Pradesh. And there are these pair of earrings that we must admire. They are elephant and lion earrings. And these are the early advancement in goldsmithing. So they are stellar examples of uh, granulation, filigree, wire work, and stamping. The other example comes from the Shunga dynasty in Magdha. And it's a pendant. And the pendant is called Tri Ratna, and it shows the shape of a trident. And trident is such a revered form in Hinduism and Buddhism. And when born, it's supposed to protect the wearer. Does that mean like in all ancient cultures, jewelry is connected to religion, military power, more than ornamentation? Is that also how it starts? Uh, absolutely. I think if we look at humanity and we can see it across the globe as well as in India, that what are the motivations? Why do we wear jewelry? I think it's fascinating. You know, you're putting something on your body. It's a sacred act of identity, of your status or your belonging to your community or religion. So all of these influences are important because jewelry, you know, body is an ultimate canvas to express our emotions and identity. So I feel all of these are really true. And it also was fascinating for us and uh, everyone who knows jewelry and loves jewelry is that diamonds originated from India. So the first known diamonds are coming from India and that's what makes the jewelry so interesting because that's where they original old cut come from. So can you tell us a bit more about this evolution, how we go from finding these diamonds to the most elaborate examples of the golden age of Indian jewelry? Well, you cannot talk about India and not talk about diamonds, as you said. Uh, diamonds, as you know, are found in India and later in Brazil. I always think about this. Who were the first people who found these alluvial diamonds? Diamonds in the rough form do look like pebbles, but glassy pebbles. But who were those people who mistakenly kind of, you know, broke open and revealed the potential of the diamond, this legendary object that our world is so enamored by? If I look at the history of India, it goes 5,000 years back, and it goes forward with so much exuberance and opulence. And if you look at the Indian jewelry history, it's been golden through and through. But zooming in historically speaking, the golden age of Indian jewelry is roughly between 16th and 19th century. And this is the same timeline as the Mughal dynasty and the magnificent Maharajas of India. A fascinating time because during this golden period, jewelry, craftsmanship, goldsmithing techniques are on their high. They have really developed. Designs often symbolic, they're overflowing with life and romance, religious iconography and motifs. But you also see diamonds from gold condor mind are dazzling. There's a riot of color literally in the gemstones and enamels. And we do see that, in fact, in the techniques that are used in this time period. So you'll have techniques such as kundan, minakari, enamel, engraving, inlay, stamping, granulation, repose, chasing, filigree or beadwork. You know, the, the list is so long. And can you tell us a bit more? Because obviously India was on the um, Silk Road, a larger trading route. So there was a lot of yeah. exchanges of craftsmanship and materials and different things happening that facilitated this expansion of trade there. Were there some centers already that emerged as the big centers for craftsmanship in India? Because I think there were many, many different kingdoms before the unification as a country. So were there already the yeah. centers that we are familiar with today or were there different centers? First, I think what you said is really fascinating to me because this is 
gems from all over the world are coming to India. Now, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. What's happening is that the famous gold come, the diamonds are now meeting the Badakhshan spinels and Burmese rubies and Ceylon sapphires. And as well as they're meeting the pearls from Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Manar, that's like greatly valued. So there's this kind of connectivity that's already happening. And as you said, there are various kingdoms. Now, India is such a diverse country that different regions had their own techniques. For example, the Northern India and the Mughal dynasty is also a great example because that's almost a culmination of Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, Persian art and the Mughal art, and it's combined. So there is Mina Vartis, Kundan foil, where the gems are set. And then if you go to down south, you have the kingdom of Mysore or the southern kingdoms, like even the Nizam of Hyderabad. And there, there is incredible the goldsmithing techniques, the repose and chasing are really finely worked. The figures of gods and goddesses are imbued in design with the flora and the fauna of the region. And if you go towards the west, you'll see love for pearl like you haven't seen. So I think there are different centers. And at the same time, they all are connected. So if the Maharaja of Patiala is wearing a necklace with seven strands of pearls, with the Maharaja of Mysore not. So there is this kind of trade happening at the same time. Is it trade or competition? <laughs> Keep being up with the Maharaja. It could be a competition too, right? <laughs> yes. And I was just also, I was wondering, where can we see this jewelry? Because a lot of the stones were taken out, were remounted. The Maharajas yeah. themselves, they brought in the 20th century, they brought a lot of the beautiful ancient historic jewelry. They brought it to actually Paris to be reset by Cartier sometimes or by other maisons. We saw it in Chaumet. So where can people see the original Indian jewelry of this golden age, Rina? And I know you know all the museums of the world. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been to all museums too. So the surviving examples of uh, historic Indian jewelry can be seen in museums and personal collections around the world. Metropolitan Museum of Art, your British Museum, National Museum in India, or the Royal Collection Trust, the British monarchy holds that. And then there are other collections as well, like the Khalili Collection or the Al Thani Collection. And what's fascinating is that the Al Thani Collection has such amazing examples of historic Indian jewelry. And some of these pieces came up at a Christie's auction called the Maharajas and Mughal Magnificence in 2019. And it went on to achieve $109 million, the highest ever auction of Indian jewelry. So they're spread out around the world. And India is also fascinating because there's this whole idea of recycling. So a lot of old pieces have been recycled, broken down or lost to history. So that's why I think it's even more important that museums are like guardians but I should also add that when we talk about the golden age of Indian jewelry, I think it's still very much on. And jewelry in India is such an unbroken link, passed from generation to generation. So many folks still own these old historic pieces. So in a way, it's like a living museum in Indian households. I love this. A few weeks ago, I think you appreciate, I asked a friend of mine who's an Indian designer and I asked him, who's the best Indian designer of all time? Just, you know, just wanted to have a bit of a background. He said, my ancestors, my great, great, great grandfathers who did this beautiful jewelry, they are the best craftsmen and best designers of all time. So I thought that was really nice that you mentioned this line and this legacy and this transmission that is still going on. That's why India is such a big market for jewelry. I think there's a love affair that's so passionate it just keeps going on and on. And Rina, now we talked about the few museums and collections where people can see Indian historic jewelry. And I was wondering, where are the biggest diamonds or the most exciting jewelry pieces from India? Something that has a story. I know you love stories. So are there some examples that you'd like to share with us? So the examples are innumerable, Sonia. It's like a treasure chest. But let me kind of pull out some gems for you examples that I would love to share. And uh, first up is the Kohinoor diamond. It's the world's most famous diamond. It's a Golconda diamond. It's a type 2B super deep diamond. And what's fascinating is that it has taken 
billions of years to form and also has a 750 year human history. So there's no other diamond in the world, in our human history, that is more widely traveled, famous or controversial, but all at once. And Kohinoor was held by the Mughal emperors, the Persian shahs, the Amirs of Afghanistan, Maharaja of Patiala, and later it ended up in the British Crown Jewel in 1849. And I had this privilege of painting the Kohinoor diamond. And this is something I always dreamt of interpreting because there are not many images of Kohinoor, but I hope my painting on canvas is the closest representation of Kohinoor. And what I did was I went ahead and made a Kohinoor diamond NFT to preserve it on the blockchain as well. The next example I would give is the Hope diamond. And Hope is a legendary deep blue diamond. It's, it's a type 2B diamond and of course has connection with the French royal jewels. And later on, it was acquired by Harry Winston, who very generously gifted the Hope Diamond to Smithsonian. And that's where it resides right now. Some other examples too, the Maharaja of Patiala, the Patiala necklace, more than 1000 carats. It was made by Cartier in 1928 for Maharaja Bhupinder Singh. So more than 1000 carats of diamonds, but the center of this necklace is a beautiful yellow diamond. It's called the De Beers Cushion Cut Yellow Diamond. Then there is a, a Patiala ruby necklace that was worn by the Maharani of Patiala. So strings of luscious rubies uh, are in there. Nizam of Hyderabad has a really huge collection of diamonds. He's a lover of diamonds. So one of his necklaces, the Nizam of Hyderabad's Golconda diamond necklace, it has triangular tape, you know, triangular shape, table cut diamonds, and various assorted diamonds too. And that came up at the Christie's sale as well, did very, very well. Two examples I would like to add here are the two royal spinels, actually. One royal spinel is 200 plus carats. It's also called Bala's Ruby. It's a giant bead, actually like a Baroque spinel bead, most probably from Badakhshan. And what is fascinating about this particular royal ruby is that on the surface of the ruby are inscribed the names of six emperors. Not many times in our history around the world, you'll see the stamp of these dynasties. So there are five Mughal emperors and then there's one Persian Shah whose name is inscribed during their reign. And the other one is an imperial necklace with 11 spinels, more than 1,000 carats, and that too has to inscribe the name of three Mughal emperors. And then I have three more examples I would like to add. One is the Baroda. The treasury of Baroda is so famous. And one of the necklaces is a three-tiered Golconda diamond necklace, and it features Star of South diamond and the English Dresden diamond. And next up is, of course, a 16th century Mughal soul emerald that's carved into a ring. It's a fascinating example. And last but not the least is a gem of an object. It's the wine cup of the Emperor Shah Jahan, entirely carved of jade. And Rina, now you've mentioned you've painted the most controversial or most famous diamonds of all time, uh, made it into an NFT. And how has the, the rich history of Indian jewelry influenced your art? Because your art is obviously your, a diamond painter, a jewelry artist as well. You make jewelry, but diamonds are a big, big part of what you do and you represent. So how has Indian jewelry and history got into your art? Wow. I mean, it's a deep question. And I think the influence has been profound, to say the least. I think Indian jewelry is like a silent language, you know. I mean, every piece does communicate stories so effortlessly and people just get it. From how I see it, you know, symbolism has been the cornerstone of Indian jewelry. So that the concepts of repetition or rotation is important. Like we see it in the repetition of the mantras or the rotation of Buddhist prayer wheel spreading goodwill or repeating arches in the architecture or, you know, multiplying motifs in textiles or jewelry. So that sort of repetition is there. And I think what happens is with repetition as a design element, you amplify and propagate the message, the underlying message. So these are some of the influences I grew up absorbing and somehow they are embedded in my design and art. You know, I also really like 
the Indian concept of center and rotation. You can see that very much in my jewelry collection. One of the collection is the Spinning Diamonds Inner Brilliance Collection. And when you look at Indian jewelry, there are these symmetrical radiating designs, but of clear marked center. And I often think, where does this idea of center come from? Perhaps it comes from the concept of atma or soul. So your inner soul, your true essence, the center of your being is eternal, is imperishable, is beyond time. So I'm fascinated by that concept. And the same concept can be seen in Sudarshan Chakra, a wheel that Hindu god Vishnu carries. And that signifies the wheel of time. It signifies the cycle of birth and rebirth. And even as a weapon against, you know, the evil forces and negativity, so now when you look at some of my work, you can see these influences speaking through. And I've always been fascinated by diamond and history. And why do people wear what they wear? And what does it say about them? And I always feel that gemstones, like whether it's in my jewelry or in my paintings, I love the characteristics that are so human, the celebratory feeling of it. You know, we all are like diamonds. We are full of potential, we are shining spirits with so much inner brilliance. And I want to kind of pick that as well in my work. But at the same time, I feel as an artist, my creative soul and influences are global as well. And what I mean by that is that they come from the home of my ancestors, India. You know, they come from the home where I live in Canada, but they also come from, you know, the home of humanity. That's our globe. So I think it's just the mix of these things that I see makes my work kind of unique and nuanced and richer. But it's always about carrying profound meaning and symbolism in all my creations, whether it's jewelry, it's paintings on canvas, sculpture or digital artwork. Sometimes these influences are visible and other times they're kind of hidden and layered, but they're always there, like an imprint. Thanks for sharing that with that, Rena. I wanted to actually, we could close on the latest artworks that you revealed that are celebrating really Indian history and jewelry, and you wanted them to be preserved in this double portrait. Can you tell us a bit more about this artwork, which is magnificent? And I know you put a lot of your art and soul in it, <laughs> as in all your other works, but I Thank think what you. was fascinating about it is the research you did into Indian jewelry to be able to integrate it into these two portraits. So can you tell us a bit more about them? And we'll share it, obviously, with our viewers as well, so they will be able to see what we're talking about. Well, thank you for asking about it, Sonia. All my artwork, I mean, I pour my heart and soul. But this idea of preserving history has been with me from the longest time, when I was just starting off as in the field of jewelry. And since then, I've been doing the historical research. So I'm a professor of jewelry as well. So this is something... I'm fascinated with. So it's not only Indian jewelry, it could be Chinese. I just, just kind of take it all in. So at some point, I knew that in Indian jewelry, things have been recycled. They are lost in time. And I wanted to kind of put all this together and return it to their rightful owners. So I made the paintings of the Maharaja, that is king, and the Maharani, that's queen of Mysore. So it's the kingdom of Mysore. It has rich, long history. And so I did this research 20 years. You know, I've been into it. I kind of sat down and I, what did I want to say through that? So I think one was that I wanted to keep a historic record, preserve the history of India in one portraiture. So the whole portrait, if you see, has a diamond-clad body of Maharaja and Maharani. It's a Golconda diamond, of course. And every inch of the canvas is studded with gemstones. It's very gem-laden. And the historically accurate gems are there as a record. But I wanted to say something more. As with all my art, there's more than what eyes can see. And that's what I like, because if it's obvious, I don't want to paint it. So I really hope that when people look at my artwork, they're reminded that they too are the Maharajas and the Maharanis of their lives. You know, they're as brilliant and they have this immense potential to live in your royalty is important. So I hope that's a reminder to really embrace yourself as bright as a diamond with the resilience and strength of a diamond and the gemstones. Because if you look at it, how did gemstones became gemstones or diamonds became diamonds? Well, they went through a lot of pressure and temperature, billions of years of process. 
And that's what we all are as humans as well. We start off rough and throughout our lives with self contemplation, reflection, and improvement, we better ourselves and we polish ourselves. So these are some of the ideas that I wanted to put in my artwork. And I'm really grateful that now the paintings are in a museum. And I think it's great that the future generations can enjoy, you know, learn more about the history of jewelry and their connection with India as well. I love this message. I love this message, especially this podcast will be the first podcast of 2024 when it's issued. So I think that's a big, big message to find your inner brilliance and show resilience for the new year. I love it. Thanks so much, Rina. And thanks for sharing your passion and your knowledge. And I encourage everyone anywhere, if you have interest in Indian jewelry, to get the book, go on Rina's website. You have written articles about it. Check the specialist. Go to museums. Go to dealers. Just learn about this fascinating period of jewelry that has been going on for millennium and the craftsmanship is still going on today. So that's really, really fascinating to know about it. Thank you so much, Rina. Thank you, Sonia. Always a joy to join you.